Hi, everyone. Welcome to Waste 360's Nothing Wasted podcast. On every episode, we invite the most interesting people in waste, recycling, and organics to sit down with us and chat candidly about their thoughts, their work, this unique industry, and so much more. So thanks for listening and enjoy this episode. Hi, everyone. This is Liz Bothwell from Waste 360 with Leon Farinick, CEO, Carbon Light Recycling. Hi, Leon, and thanks for being on the show today. Hi. Hi, Liz. Thank you for having me. So, Leon, we normally start at the beginning of the show, so I'd love to hear a little bit about your background and how you ended up in recycling. Sure. Uh, of course, uh, uh, I was born in uh, New York, and uh, then uh, my father was from Iran, and we moved back to Iran, and uh, uh, I was there till I was 15 years old. Then I came back and went to high school in U.S. and uh, college here in California. And uh, then uh, went back actually to Iran and built my first plant in uh, when I was about, I think I was 22 years old, and built my first plastic packaging plant because my father was already I- involved in plastic packaging. At that time in Iran, we had manufacturing facilities. And uh, so I built my first plant at that time. And then unfortunately, as you're, as you're well aware, that we had the unfortunate situation in Iran and we had to leave and started the whole life again in the United States and uh, build a small company in 1979 and grew it. Uh, to be a what do you call sizable company in in plastic uh, grocery sacks actually there's uh, we were one of the first ones who brought those grocery sacks that to, you use today in the supermarket into US and then from there on I purchased several other companies and put them together all in plastic packaging and of course, when you are involved in plastic packaging, you automatically are involved in recycling, meaning that you recycle your own waste inside your plant. So you're constantly in a recycling mode to try not to have material go into the landfills or outside. So uh, uh, in uh, 2002, as, uh, in 2002, not exactly the dates, but in 2002, I purchased a packaging company and uh, in packaging uh, food items and cakes, cookies, it was PET packaging. PET is really polyester. That's what we are involved in. That's what all the beverage companies use for their beverage uh, uh, usage. And... Uh, I purchased a company, and at that time, I decided that we should do some recycling because we wanted to have post-consumer content in our packaging at that time. So we built a plant in the 2000s and uh, ended up to uh, have uh, a recycling plant in West Virginia, actually, and use that material in our finished products so we have uh, post-consumer content in our packaging. So uh, from then on, of course, in 2010, I sold pretty much all my uh, uh, businesses and then put my focus at that time. My feeling was sooner or later, recycling has to be the most important uh, important uh, aspect in uh, plastics because we cannot have the issue of plastics, as everybody talks about all the time, ending up in landfills, ending up in oceans, in waterways. And uh, my feeling was sooner or later uh, uh, that this will become a major issue for all uh, uh, plastic packages. So uh, at that time, I uh, in 2010, I thought about it and decided that we should build a recycling facility to start with and uh, 
recycle plastic bottles, meaning they take bottles from the market, mostly in California, for example, we started to take uh, used bottles and transform them again back to raw material that customers can again make new bottles from. So that's how uh, Carbon Light got started in 2010, and we went in production in 2012. Great. And I, I love that perspective that you actually came from packaging. I hadn't realized that. What a great perspective in order to to build a recycling facility and know what all the nuances are and what you're looking for in a product, in a recycled product. Yes. As I said in my, uh, li- in my business lifetime, I have built uh, 22 plants from scratch and all in plastic packaging. So I'm well familiar with the plastic industry and that's why I felt that uh, sooner or later, uh, recycling gonna be the future of this industry. And uh, we can see that today now and mostly because no plastic or nothing else really in general uh, biodegrades in landfills. Landfills need oxygen and light or uh, to really biodegrade anything. So in reality, you never can, nothing can get uh, uh, biodegrade in, in a landfill. I, the proven fact is that once I was challenged, that no uh, paper, you know, because that time when I was in plastic uh, grocery sacks, I was challenged into that no other things get, bi- you know, they get, uh, they are biodegradable and they will biodegrade in the landfill. And I said, okay, let's prove a point. So we went and uh, uh, dug out a landfill and took out a, a newspaper. 80 years old newspaper that was from 80 years ago. And you could literally look at it and read the news 80 years ago. And that was my proof that I showed everybody that doesn't matter, plastic, paper, whatever you can think of cannot biodegrade in a landfill. And that's when I proved the point that uh, uh, the only solution I see, of course, in Europe and all that, they have other solutions in burning plastic or and creating energy. But of course, uh, again, you have the issue of pollution or issue of CO2 in the atmosphere. So my feeling is, and our feel, my feeling at that time was recycling is really the very the only option. Now, of course, you have different kinds of recycling, but our recycling, as we call it, we call it a mechanical recycling, that we literally take bottles, wash them down completely, then goes through a grinding system, and then again, it's washed uh, very clearly, and then that material goes into special equipment that make it food grade and pelletize and make the resin that would be that uh, then it's sold to major beverage companies to make new bottles all over again. So our idea is bottle to bottle means that we our specialty is only in PET and polyester and uh, we focus on that heavily and it's the most uh, used in the market, one of the most used material in the world. Uh, it's about 100 billion pounds of PET or polyester is used in the world every year. Out of that, of course, uh, 70 billion pounds of it ends up to be clothing and carpets and other, uh, other uh, wearable items. And 30% of it in the world ends up to be packaging. And uh, about close to 6 billion pounds of it is used in the United States for beverage containers and another 3 to 4 billion for other types of uh, food packaging is used in the United States. So it's a very well used material and the good thing about it is that the bottles are collected and by MRFs, by people who collect garbage, 
and then they will, what they do is then separate the bottles, the, the PET bottles as we call it, or polyester bottles, and separate it, and then we buy that material, and then we transform it, as I said, into a finished resin to be able to make new bottles again. We do not make bottles or anything like that. We only make the raw material. Gotcha. That's been a pretty interesting process, though. And then, Liam, I'd love to learn more about your new plant in Pennsylvania. Could you tell us about that? Yes, we have uh, three plants as of now. We have a plant here in Riverside, California, and then we have a plant in Dallas, Texas. And our third plant, that mo our most advanced plant, is built in Pennsylvania. Actually, it's just starting to start up. We unfortunately had some delays in that respect because of the corona situation. Of course, that hurt us in all over the facilities, but especially in Pennsylvania because we couldn't bring in our engineers from Europe because a part of our equipment comes from Europe and we couldn't bring engineers from Europe to uh, help us start up the production. So now we are, they are, some of them are back and we were working on that and we have started some production in Pennsylvania. It's a very, very sophisticated plant and uh, we have spent over 70 to $80 million to build it. Uh, they are very, very uh, expensive uh, plants. They are, they are huge investments. And uh, uh, if you want to meet the requirements of beverage companies, you have to be very good at the quality what you create. And the only way to really create the right quality for your customers is uh, a very sophisticated plant. So uh, uh, Pennsylvania is, as I mentioned, very sophisticated. Even we have robots in place that help us uh, in certain areas. So uh, hope that would, and it is the largest plant in our group. We are today the largest producer of food grade material in, in the United States and in the world. And uh, we are very proud of it, that we are doing something right for the environment. We save over 180,000 tons of carbon footprint a year versus for our customers, versus them using virgin material. And uh, so I'm doing my share uh, for the environment. It's a very tough business. Uh, it's easy to talk about it, but I would consider it uh, after 40 years in plastic business, I would consider this the hardest business I ever attempted to, uh, you know, to achieve. Wow. And what makes it so difficult? Because in reality, Liz, if you're taking um, garbage, in a sense, because you're taking bottles that have been used and mixed in with garbage and all that, and you're taking those kind of bottles, and then transforming it into a, a resin in a material, a raw material that is usable in water bottles, in all kinds of, uh, what do you call, beverage containers. So you have to go through a lot of uh, decontamination to make sure that meets the approval of, uh, you know, huge beverage companies. So uh, Absolutely. Take, so that's real reality, taking garbage and making it into a food-grade material that is uh, passes through the systems of the, uh, you know, major be beverage companies. And how much are you handling now at that facility, whether it's by day or hour? I'm not sure how you're measuring it. No, we, we will be, when it's in full production, in, in all of our facilities, when... Pennsylvania uh, gets going as well. All over the country, we would be using over 1 million pounds of dirty material, or some, some of it, of course, is deposit uh, bottles that are cleaner. We would be using about a million pounds of uh, bales of bottles a day. And so yeah. for every day, we're going to be purchasing over a million uh, pounds of bottles 
and transforming it into a finished good resin and uh, material for our customers. That's fantastic. Now, Leon, are you starting to see an increased demand for these types of materials compared to virgin? Yes, we, yes, we are. We are, of course, we are in all aspects. We are sold out in all our facilities. The issue, of course, is to make the material and deliver. And unfortunately, we have had a lot of headaches throughout the year. 2020 was not a good year uh, because of our issues with uh, the coronavirus and uh, people getting sick, unfortunately, and uh, creating stoppages. So we had a very, uh, what I would say, a tough time in 2020. And hopefully with vaccines on the way and uh, people feeling better, hopefully we have a better 2021 in front of us. But it was a, a very tough year for us. Oh, I bet. A lot of people feel that pain. It's been it's been a rough year, but it's just amazing that you were able to get the facility done and keep it moving forward. So congrats on that. Thank you. Took a lot of what you call financing and took a lot of help from we have a great group of people who work for us. We have great team of management. So it's people who make it happen. It's not you know, uh, it's really the people and you have to take care of your own people. They are the ones who make it happen, not uh, I might have the foresight or might have some dream, but without a good management team and without good employees, you you know, dreams are hard to achieve. <laughs> Absolutely. I agree with that. <laughs> so true. And I feel like this industry brings really attracts a, um, a really great type of person. So I'm sure your team is wonderful. It is, a, as I said, a, a very tough business, not a clean business. So people who work in recycling, uh, mostly in the type of our business, are go through, uh, you know, it's not a fun business, let's put it that way. It's, you, it's, uh, you're taking garbage, so you have your issues. Right, exactly. <laughs> So I know so much has happened since the China bans on recycling and contaminated materials. Um, do you think, I mean, it sounds like you definitely are. Do you think the U.S. as a whole is stepping up and innovating as a result of this? In reality, Liz, we have no choice. We have to. There is no ifs, buts about it. Everybody is working hard because since the China wall went up, uh, of course, uh, Everybody started facing a lot of difficulties. What to do the material? Unfortunately, a lot of the material has ended up in landfills. And that's what we don't want because uh, I have said something that uh, I said that a while ago as well. And it's a good saying. I like it when, when I say it. I say 50 years from now, Liz, I'm not around, but 50 years from now or 30 years from now, things go pretty fast. I think mining uh, landfills would become a huge business because people will mine landfills and take out all this stuff because every single thing in those landfills are recyclable and can become a product. So I think, uh, 50, I said 30 to 50 years from now, landfills will be the big mining business and people taking it out and then looking at it and saying, those people those days were crazy. Why would they throw this kind of uh, all this material out in a landfill? They could have made new material out of it. But that's what we have. We have in Europe, of course, you have a lot less landfill availability, so people are much more innovative in bringing, you know, doing recycling. Here we have uh, we are blessed with a lot of land, and uh, so we have a lot of. Uh, uh, what do you call uh, places to dump our uh, our usage, and we are as Americans, we are the uh, what do you call the most uh, consumable uh, packaging and consumable in every aspect in the world. So we consume a lot and we create a lot of uh, garbage as well. So uh, a lot of it ends up in the landfills. It definitely does. And um, to your point, I do think that 
we have been forced to innovate maybe faster than we had planned, but um, we're definitely seeing the results of that. Yeah, I think you're seeing, I am even seeing a lot of people getting involved in a lot of different kinds of things, how to use the materials for furnishing, for uh, other, you know, uh, park benches. Uh, a lot of companies are involved in uh, taking the material and making other material, housing material out of it. So there's a lot of, uh, we have to do something because we can't just continue dumping it in the landfills. And unfortunately, some of it ends up in our waterways, then in the oceans, then we see what we have faced with the oceans and environment. And uh, unfortunately, we don't have a good answer for the size of uh, garbage in, in, the, in the ocean. Uh, we don't have a quick answer. I, I wish we could stop the garbage going into the oceans in the mouth of what do you call those rivers that go uh, into the oceans from us, from or you know, all, all over the world. If we could do something that things don't enter, the you know, stop the garbage or stop all material from entering uh, the ocean at the mouth of the river, not I mean at the end of the where it enters the ocean, not to let it go and then have this huge uh, Texas side, as they say of uh, garbage uh, swirling in the ocean. So it's unfortunate and people are, uh, I'm hoping that uh, people take more, uh, have a more conscious of uh, not throwing things in the waterways or just throwing in uh, garbage and not taking care of it. But our infrastructure in US is not as advanced and a lot of the beverage companies are working hard to uh, help out and create uh, situations that people can bring back their bottles. Uh, of course, you have, um, in US, you have 10 states that have the deposit system, so they do a very good job of uh, collecting the bottles and recycling, uh, you know, uh, being recycled. So. I wish it was all across the country that everybody had a deposit system or other systems. I mean, you have reverse vending machines that Europeans use, yeah. use a lot. You can have a vending machine in front of every single store of Walmart or Costco or Target, all your big stores, and, and have the people, giving the people the opportunity to bring back their bottles and putting it back into those machines and get a, what do you call, a coupon or whatever to go and sh use it for shopping inside that store. So that's done very heavily in Europe. I mean, Germany has a 95% recycling or uh, collection system. And uh, we just have to learn. We have to do it and uh, uh, help out at least on the, unfortunately, in the United States, we only collect about 29 to 30% of all the bottles. Imagine 70% of it ends up in landfills and uh, in other areas, unfortunately, waterways, other areas. But we lose 70% of it and uh, not being used. So that's, that's, our, that's our biggest issue that, that I guess beverage companies are facing and uh, uh, needs to be attended to, and something should be done about it. Definitely, and that whole resident and consumer behavior angle comes in, right, in education on how to properly recycle, what is actually recyclable, and, um, you know, kind of beyond the bin. So I, I'd love to see some of the bigger beverage companies working with partnerships like the Recycling Partnership to actually field these studies and, and do them and actually see how they can they can raise recycling rates and reduce contamination at the same time. Totally agree with you. You need uh, the beverage companies right now with the commitments they have made in the market that by 2025 they want to be at least 25% of uh, you need the 
what do you call just to achieve that 25 percent you need 12 plants like our plant in Pennsylvania to be able to supply the needs of the beverage companies but of course you need the your collection to uh, improve drastically as well because you might have the plants but you might not have the uh, what do you call the used bottles uh, right. to recycle so so it's a combination of a hand in hand with uh, and uh, you know beverage companies uh, uh, of course need to help uh, recyclers to uh, what do you call stay alive to be able to do what they are trying to do a sense of uh, what do you call helping in the market you can see now I, I it's the first time I saw it last night I saw advertising on TV actually of collect your bottles, please bring back your bottles. I know very nice advertising by the, by the beverage companies, major beverage companies. So it was very impressive. So they really understand the situation they're facing and they're working hard at it. It's not, unfortunately, it's not something that can be resolved overnight. It takes time and uh, people will, uh, you know, get used to uh, doing the right thing because 30% or 29% uh, collection is not acceptable. I mean, that is really, uh, I would consider it a disaster compared to Europe at, you know, as I said, Germany at 95%. Uh, funny enough, I tell you, uh, in Oregon, if I'm not mistaken, in Oregon, they increased their... Uh, you know, people bring back their bottles in deposit states. They get five cents or ten cents, depending on the size. They increased in Oregon. They increased the, their repay to ten cents, and all of a sudden, their uh, collection rate from I think it was in 70s became close to over 90 percent of collecting all the bottles uh, in the in the state. So. It's only a matter of, uh, uh, what do you call, Ma unfortunately, matter of money and, uh, and unfortunately, matter of uh, uh, introducing financial capability, you know, giving money to people to do what is the right thing to do from the first place. So, uh, but you have to give incentive to people to do things. That's why I think the bigger answer and I think the best answer is reverse vending machines that are now very, very sophisticated. They can do what you call 100 bottles in a matter of minute and uh, uh, collect it and then a collection system that comes around and collects all the bottles from all this equipment and, being re and then recycle it. And then people, the incentive for people is come back Bring your bottle, and then we, you get coupons to uh, what do you call uh, buy your grocery item. Then people will be in, uh, incentivized to do that, and uh, I think that's one of the best ways to increase co uh, what I say collection. For example, in Germany, the deposit uh, for a bottle is over thirty cents euro, meaning that if you you paid a deposit of over 30 cents euro to get that bottle, to get the, your beverage. And then, of course, because it's so expensive, people always bring it back to get back their credit back. Here, with five cents, people are not as much incentivized as if they had to pay 20 cents or 30 cents for uh, recycling or for uh, what you call for their beverage bottles. And... Uh, then they would really be incentivized to bring it back and get their money back or use it as their shopping, uh, you know. So, right, absolutely. <laughs> it's it's a lot about incentives and, you know, what motivates people and what will actually make them do this. So I think there's a lot we could do and have to do. We, we have no choice. I, I'm really saying it, Liz, that... I don't see any choice, but doesn't matter how we recycle, but, uh, you know, we have to, any item that we use, 
I mean, there's, it's got to be, uh, I, I feel that 30 years from now or so, your garbage out of your house, every single item of it will be recycled. Meaning that from your food, uh, you know, to go to, uh, what do you call it? Uh, composting would be the biggest thing for food items. And unfortunately, we don't have enough composting across the uh, United States. I think the best composting is in, in, in San Francisco area or something. But bottom line of it is that, uh, uh, that no garbage, no, nothing that you use in your household should end up in a, in a landfill. All of it should be, become another product, a new product, or same product back again. So that's, that, that's the future. You just, that, there's no way around that system. Really, there is no way around that system. And uh, people who use packaging, companies who use packaging in every aspect, uh, they have to take responsibility, I mean, and uh, make sure that uh, it happens that way, that the products get recycled because we have, uh, out of plastic industry, we have five, six different items of different properties that are not recycled and they're all ending up in landfills. And it's a shame. It really is a shame that everything can be uh, if I'm talking only about plastics, everything in plastic field can become another product or can be recycled. There's no such a thing as a non-recyclable plastic. So uh, we have a long ways to go, and and for a lot of investments, billions and billions of dollars of investment for people to do it. And to do something and to invest billions of dollars, you want to make sure that you're very... You know, it's a profitable business. Unfortunately, right now, recycling is and hasn't been a profitable business for anyone, including us. It's a, it's a very tough business, and it takes time till you uh, get, you know, uh, become profitable company in recycling. So recycling has its own issues, and it needs the brand owners, and it needs all the people who use packaging to uh, make sure that recyclers, there are more recyclers in the market, should be more recyclers, should help them to recycle and help them financially to uh, build more plants because more plants we have for recycling, more competition, you have more, uh, more of all good things. They can even then, uh, the prices can be more competitive with the virgin material uh, in the market. So. It has to go hand in hand. It definitely does. And then um, I wanted to ask you about your locations for your plants. Are you are you basing that on your customers and their locations, or or how do you find your next location? Yes, uh, our locations are very close to our customer base because that's how we uh, locate our plant. Is all uh, near our customers, like in Pennsylvania, we are near all the uh, our customers that are located in Allentown, that Allentown, Pennsylvania, that use a lot of our material. In Dallas, we are literally across the street from our uh, what do you call uh, one of our customers. Uh, so literally, yes, because you. You have to ship your material. Most of our material is shipped in bulk trucks. So it cannot go long distances. So most of our customers are within uh, 50 miles or 40 miles or 30 miles of our facility or even 100 yards away. So yes, we locate our facilities near our customer base and that's what uh, they are excited about. Oh, that's fantastic. And it's Sounds like you work with a lot of the major uh, beverage companies. Yes, all of them, uh, all major beverage companies today are heavily working with post consumer. They want to enhance their usage. You can see bottles in market now with 100% post consumer content. So everybody is trying, but of course, uh, the availability, it's not just uh, beverage companies. I mean, you have all the cosmetic companies wanting the ones that use PET in their shampoos or 
other areas want post-consumer and they are, you know, you have all your PNGs of the world using a lot of uh, uh, what do you call post-consumer material. Uh, Walmart, Costco, and uh, Target, all the big stores uh, uh, would uh, or requiring that their suppliers, uh, what do you call, give them material that has post-consumer content in it. They are very strict on that. Unfortunately, to be honest, uh, what happens is uh, they are they are they want post-consumer and they want recyclability. But when it comes to the pricing and when it comes to pay for it, unfortunately, they, uh, you know, doesn't happen. And then that's what creates, it's a, uh, what do you call it? Uh, it's, a, uh, it's, a, it's a chain reaction. Uh, you know, uh, a bottle company or a beverage company or a packaging company goes to Walmart and says, I have to pay a lot more than Virgin for post-consumer. And Walmart says, no, you have to have a post-consumer, but, yeah, but we're not going to pay more. So go figure out something else to do, but keep our price the same. So what you're facing is you're not getting the, uh, the Walmarts of the world to pay uh, what you call the extra price they need or extra for the, the suppliers of their packaging to be able to uh, pay more for their uh, usage of post-consumer. So it all goes down and comes to people like us that, uh, you know, we don't make any money. And, you know, you don't, you know, you, they can, literally they can destroy all recycling in the United States by uh, what you call, not accepting the fact. It's like, I love recycling and I love you to have post-consumer in my, what you call, in my product line but I don't want to pay for it. And go figure out how to do it without paying more for it. This is really responsibilities of the Walmarts, the Costcos, the Targets, all these biggies, to be much more aggressive in a sense of trying to help, uh, what you call, this, uh, this situation. There are a lot of groups that beverage companies are really trying to help and uh, you have the yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. Ellen MacArthur Foundation that is working very hard, you know, for you know towards environmental goals. We appreciate that, and beverage companies are putting resources and uh, you know financial support to try to get recycling better. But you know they are forced; they are, they are faced with a situation that they are uh, what do you call. They need the Walmarts of the world to help them out in, uh, in pricing and uh, helping them out. You cannot ask your supplier, I want 100% post-consumer or I want 50% of your bottle to be post-consumer, but you know what? Uh, I'm not paying more for it. It is an unfortunate situation. It's uh, that has to change. That mentality in the market has to change for recycling to succeed. If that doesn't change, nothing changes because the, the suppliers, the manufacturers, all that, they are trying to, to be you know, profitable as well. You can't blame them. And then they come to people like us and say, we cannot pay more because we, uh, you know, we cannot charge more. So as I said, it just, it's just, it's an effect. It goes from the top and then the bottom. And you have to have, I think, in our, in U.S., with the, an amount of consumption that each person in the United States uh, does, you know, the consumption. We are the largest consumers in the world. We have to have tremendous uh, amount of uh, recycling or uh, there are now chemical recycling discussions and everything else. But we have to have a lot more recycling infrastructure so, so uh, materials don't end up in landfills and, uh, you know, and make it profitable for MRFs to be able to recycle, you know, to separate the uh, packaging and everything else 
to be able to not put it in landfills. But as I said, we have a lot of land and we can just dump and that's the easiest, fastest way to, uh, what do you call, get rid of uh, garbage. And that's not, that's not our future. No, and, and you're right. The model has to work and the infrastructure has to be in place. So it will have to be a full-on effort uh, by everyone to make this work and things have to change. And um, it, it, to your point, they will have to change in order for this to succeed. Exactly. I just read that you're making a pelletized material as well. Can you tell me a little bit about that and what it's used for? Uh, I want to understand the question better. Pelletize, we pelletize everything. So the material we sell to the beverage companies and other packaging groups is pelletized material. But maybe you're talking about more of a, what we are doing with, because what we are doing as well, we are taking caps and labels of uh, our yeah, bottles. That's, that's so what okay. I mean. Yep. So that's what you're talking about. We are taking caps and labels of the bottles and uh, uh, manufacturing a material that can be used to make uh, trash cans and other items that are not food contact items. And uh, we do that as well because we are, as we grow and as we learn, because this has been a we were the, one of the first big uh, recyclers in U.S. of the bottle uh, recycling. So we are learning as we go after eight years in production. We're learning a lot, and we're trying to stop putting things in landfills. So we try to come up with answers for all of our, what you call, unused material that we have a lot of it, and uh, think of ways to make that into a finished good as well. So that's what we're working towards. Oh, that's fantastic to hear. Awesome. Well, you're doing so many great things, Leon. Is there anything else that you're paying attention to in, in the world of waste and recycling? No, this is what you call, of course, uh, there's a lot of you know, areas of plastic that can be recycled and uh, people are looking more into it. And uh, as I said, as long as you uh, make it profitable for the companies like us, then you will have a lot more suppliers and a lot more recyclers, and uh, we'll be a better country and a you know better world. So that's that's uh, my opinion. Uh, well, that's that's a good opinion, and I like your vision and where you think we are going because it's a it's a great place so thank you for your time and i look forward to hearing more um about the pennsylvania plan and any future facilities that you do you're doing yeah, great yeah, stuff are, thank you for sending time if uh, hopefully we are successful in our uh what do you call growth and all that and we will grow uh, our customers really want us in a lot of locations but uh, you know, there's uh, issues of uh, financials and issues of investments, but uh, beverage companies really want to really help out and do uh, recycling and help recyclers and uh, have more plants of recycling. So, But again, I mentioned that collection is a very, very important aspect because if you don't have it, it doesn't matter how many plants you have if you cannot get... Uh, the material into your facility. Right. Yes, you need obviously need that. So, well, it sounds like you have a good plan, and um, I really appreciate you spending time today. I feel like I learned a lot, and our listeners will too. Thanks, Leon. Thank you. Have a great day, Liz.